I welcome you today to our fifth uh, midweek manna here at Community Bible Church. And if the background looks a little different to you, it should, because we are in the process of moving to our new building that we purchased a while ago, and uh, we decided to, to record the midweek manna here in this building. Our worship services will still be recorded in the, our old building for uh, two or three more weeks, but we did decide to do the midweek manna here at our new building, so that's why the background looks a bit differently. Uh, the first four weeks, we have been recapping large sections of Scripture in first Peter that, that I had already covered in our adult Sunday school class over the last several months. But today we're finally going to be honing in on some new verses that, that hadn't been covered. So if you've been in the class before, we're now into new material. And rather than look at a large section of scripture, we're going to look at just five verses today. But before we begin, let's bow for a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we can spend together looking into your word. And we thank you for Peter and the wonderful words that he gives us as he exhorts us to live uh, lives of grace, even in a graceless world. The words that he wrote almost 2,000 years ago, they speak clearly to us today as well. And so as we consider them together, encourage us and challenge us by them, Lord. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, do a little bit of review. We know that the Apostle Peter was the author of this, this book, this epistle. Uh, he re wrote it from Rome probably in about 63 to 65 A.D., a little over 30 years after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. So by now, Peter is an older man. He's a very mature, seasoned believer as he shares his wisdom with these early Christians who were living in what is modern-day Turkey. It was called Asia Minor at that time. And what was happening again? They were beginning to face tremendous persecution under the, the reign of Emperor Nero in the Roman Empire. They were falsely accused, as were the, the early Christians, of many, many different things. And, and because of their faith in Christ, they were facing suffering and persecution. And Paul, or Peter writes to them to encourage them that even in the midst of this persecution and suffering, they should stand firm on God's grace and that they should seek to live graceful lives even in a graceless world. Well, I have divided the book again into three major sections. We've already looked at the first two and part of the third one. The first major section, Paul dealt with grace for salvation. He laid the foundation of, of their salvation and our salvation. He, he shared with them how they are, that salvation is certain, it's secure. He talked about things that should flow out of that salvation. And then we looked the next week about grace for submission. That as these early believers were falsely accused, he says, here's how you should respond to governmental authorities, to those in authority over you, maybe in the workplace, and, and how relationships in the family should properly work. And he talked about having grace to properly respond to, to people in authority over us. And then last week we looked at, started looking at the third major section where Peter really focuses in on the issue of suffering. And I call this last section grace for suffering. And last week we looked at chapter 3, verse 13, all the way through chapter 4, verse 6, a large section of that scripture where, where he talked about the reality of suffering, the fact that we are going to suffer. There is going to be persecution. And yet in the midst of it, Peter said, we should maintain righteous living even in the midst of that persecution. He talked about the mission of Christ, how he was falsely treated or wrongly treated, and yet he did it for our benefit. And then also he talked about how we should recognize our suffering, recognize persecution. We should accept it as God's will. We should expect misunderstanding from people around us, but yet we should still always look forward to the great reward that we will have because of our relationship through Jesus Christ. So that was the first part of the, the, the last major section of this book where, where Peter was dealing with grace for suffering. He dealt with the issue of uh, the reality of our suffering. But now today, and now through the next three weeks or so, he's going to deal with the second major section where he talks about the results or, or the response to suffering. How should we respond even as we face suffering? And that's going to run from chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verse 7, through chapter 5, verse 11, almost to the end of the book. And we might ask the question, how do we respond when we face difficulties and persecution? Uh, then another question, how should we respond? Maybe they're not the same. 
Uh, and finally, we should say, well, what are some actions that we should take in spite of our suffering, in spite of our persecution? And that's what I believe Peter's going to focus on in these major sections. First of all, today, as we look at verses 7 through 11 of chapter 4, in this section, I like to say that he's telling us that even in the midst of persecution and suffering, we should continue to serve other people. We should continue to serve other people in spite of the problems. Let's, let's read verses 7 through 11. He says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, as Peter encourages us to continue serving other people, there's four ways he says we should do that in this passage. And the first is he's going to talk about being stable in prayer, being stable in prayer. The second way he's going to say is to be steadfast in love. The third way is to be selfless in hospitality. And finally, the fourth way is we're to continue to be stewards of of God's grace. Now let's break those all down. First of all, in verse 7, he talks about being stable in prayer. Let's read that verse again. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. It's interesting. Peter starts out with the words, the end of all things is near. Now he's referring here ultimately to the second coming of Christ. And as I've said in past weeks, Eight times in the book of 1 Peter, Peter refers to or alludes to the second coming of Christ. And this is the fifth time that he alludes to it with this phrase. Now, what's interesting about that phrase is he says, the end of all things is near. Well, from our perspective, we're thinking, that was 2,000 years ago he said that. How could he say to those people, the end is near, and 2,000 years later, we're still waiting for that event to happen? Well, we have to remember that God's timing is not our timing. A time to God means nothing. He is eternal. So what to us seems like a long time in God's framework of time, it can be an instant. But really, I think the issue is he's dealing here with what we sometimes call imminence. The fact that Jesus Christ could come any time. Uh, it's going to happen suddenly. It might even happen unexpectedly. And so we always need to be ready. James referred to the same thing in, in James chapter 5. He wrote, You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. James would have written probably bef well before Peter wrote the book of 1 Peter, and even he was saying, The coming of the Lord is near. 2,000 years later, we're still waiting. In the book of Revelation, which was written near the end of the first century by the Apostle John, as he recorded these wonderful visions from Jesus, at the very end of the book, chapter 22, verse 20, speaking of Jesus, he says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. That's Jesus speaking, saying, I'm coming quickly. He hasn't come for 2,000 years, but we know that he, he is going to be coming and we should always be ready. I think of a, if you're at home and maybe your house is a little bit of a mess, you haven't cleaned it up lately, and you, you get a phone call from someone that says, I'm going to be over in 10 minutes. Uh, we've all been here. We scurry around. We straighten the magazines up. We stick the, sick, the, the, the dishes in the dishwasher. We maybe throw a few things in the closet. We clean the place up quickly because we know someone's coming. Well, that's not the best picture of what we should do as believers because we should always be ready, always be prepared for the second coming of Christ. But the fact that it could happen any time, that it could be near, should cause a sense of urgency in us to live a life that honors Jesus Christ. But in, in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, 
Peter writes again 2,000 years ago that there were mockers who looked at these early believers and said, where's the sign of his coming? You've been saying this for years. Nothing's changed. Everything's the same. He's not coming back. And there would be people today who would say the same thing to believers. Jesus isn't coming back. Why do you think that? If Jesus promised he's coming back, and he promised it many times and in many places, we can be certain he's coming back. And it could be soon, and we need to be ready for that. But notice he says, since the end is near, we should be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. He talks about being, having sound judgment, be, being clear-minded, being prudent, being sensible in the way we approach prayer and having a properly controlled mind. He talks about having a sober spirit. And in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, verse 13, he uses a similar word. He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. And then in chapter 5, verse 8, that we'll get to in a couple of weeks, he starts verse 8 out and says, be of sober spirit. This idea of, of being sober in our approach to prayer and in our minds is very crucial. We think of someone who's intoxicated. They're controlled by an outside substance. And, and he says, don't be like that. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit and, and be sober in your mind. Be of, of sound judgment. Because if we don't have sound judgment, we're, our prayers will probably not be proper. We might pray more for our wants rather than for our needs and the things that God would desire for us to have. As we pray for other people, we might really pray wrongly for them. But he says you need to pray in stability and pray with a sound mind so that you're interceding for people in ways that would honor God and seek his will in people's lives. Maybe a lesson I would draw for us is that one way we can serve other people, even during times of suffering, is by praying for them and doing so with a clear, sound mind that is focused on the will of God. And for us, prayerfulness also can help bring a sense of calmness, even when we're facing difficult times, because it focuses our attention back on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and that gives us a confidence. You think of a small child, maybe an a, a infant or a small toddler who is in another room and they get scared of something or they start crying and fussing and their, their mother or father comes in and says, I, I'm here, I'm here, everything's going to be okay. And the presence of that parent brings a calmness to that child. It should be that way with us. As we remember and are reminded of Jesus Christ and him being with us, as we do that in prayer, it should bring a calmness in our hearts. Well, Peter says that we should uh, be stable in prayer. But then he goes on in verse 8 and says that we should also be steadfast in love. Let's read verse 8. He says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. He starts out with two words, above all. Of utmost importance, Peter says, keep fervent in your love for one another. As times get tough, Peter says, as Christ's coming draws near, having a love for one another is extremely important. Back in chapter 1 again of 1 Peter, verse 22, he said, Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. This idea of fervently loving one another is a theme all the way through the book of First Peter, and he shares it here as well. And this is in contrast to the world. I'd like to read two passages of Scripture, one from the book of Matthew where Jesus is speaking, the other is from the book of Second Timothy where the Apostle Paul is writing. But listen to what Jesus and the Apostle Paul say about what the nature of the world will be like in the end times. And certainly it's been that way throughout all of history, but more so as time draws to a close. And think about our world today and see if these aren't descriptions of the world we live in. In Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking prophetically here to his disciples, but he says, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, 
most people's love will grow cold. How does that speak to the world we live in, even here in America today? Because lawlessness is increased, people's love has grown cold. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, uh, Paul is writing, he says, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godlessness, although they have denied its power. And then Paul says, avoid such men as these. The world we live in today is filled with divisions, filled with injustices, it's filled with racism, it's filled with personal attacks of one another, and with our social media, it's so easy to attack other people, and I would appeal to us as believers in Jesus Christ, please be careful what we, what we post on social media, what we say to other people. Yes, we might disagree strongly with others. Maybe it's the other party from what we agree with, and, and there are maybe major differences, but God calls us to respond differently. He calls us to be steadfast in our love, certainly toward other believers, but even toward the unbelieving world or to others who disagree with us on major issues. We, we might have, have major issues that we, we should disagree with them on, but how we treat them, how we respond to them, let's be cautious not to put things on that are inflammatory, that are derogatory toward people, that are mean-spirited. That's not the way of love. That's not the way Jesus Christ would have us respond. And as Christians, we have to be cautious of that. I would, would, would uh, challenge us to guard the things that we post on social media, the way we speak of other people, do it in a way that is respectful to their humanity. But Peter is saying, I think, in a sense, as believers in Christ, we are to go against the flow of the world. The world, as we read in Matthew and 2 Timothy, is going to continually become more unloving. But we are to fervently love one another from the heart. He says, don't fall into the trap of the world. Don't respond as the world responds. Then he says, the reason is because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, that's an interesting statement. Uh, let's first of all look at what it doesn't mean when, when Peter says that love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't mean that we're simply to ignore sin. It doesn't mean that as we see sin in a fellow believer's life or in the life of a church, that we're just to ignore it and let it go on and not worry about it. Certainly, we are called as believers to, to lift one another up. If a brother falls into sin, we're to help restore them. Uh, if a sister falls into sin, she should, should be restored. We should guard against sin within a church. It doesn't mean we ignore sin. It also doesn't mean that our own sins are forgiven or taken care of simply because we show loving actions to someone else. Some would say, well, because I'm showing love toward other people, God will kind of turn a blind eye to my sin, or my sin is no big issue. That's not what, what Peter means when he says love covers a multitude of sins. I think what it does mean, and it could mean several things, it's probably a variety of things, but one thing is that it's not blind to sin, but it is true that we continue to love other people in spite of their sin. We all continue to sin, and I think Peter is saying if we love properly, Yes, we might need to deal with sin and, and help lift up a, a fallen brother or sister, but we should not stop loving them because of their sin. We should continue to love them in spite of it. And that relates then to being forgiving people. Uh, parable in the New Testament, Jesus talked about forgiveness. And at the end of it, Peter says, well, Lord, how many times should we forgive people? Up to seven times? See, seven times was kind of the rabbinical standard for how many times you're required to forgive someone, and after that you didn't have to do it. Jesus said, no, I say to you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. What he meant was you're to forgive innumerable times. However much it takes, you continue to forgive. 
uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love chapter. And I'm going to be referring to this later also in, in our sharing time today. But in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about love. And here's what he says, familiar words. He says, love is patient, love is kind, is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, it is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Notice Paul said it does not take into account a wrong suffered. As people maybe sin against us, as they offend us, he says we need to be careful how we respond. We need to respond lovingly. And, and even though we maybe have been hurt, we should still forgive in spite of that. And we shouldn't hold people's sins against them. Uh, in, in Proverbs 10, verse 12, in fact, this is probably the verse that Peter had in his mind when he made this statement here in, in uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 8. In Proverbs 10, verse 12, it says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. Love covers all sin. That's exactly what Peter said in verse 8, that love covers a multitude of sins. I think another thing is it's very easy for us when we see sin in another person, even another fellow believer. We like to gossip about it. We like to share that sin. We like to kind of expose it to other people. And sometimes as believers, we do it very subtly. Well, we need to be praying for so-and-so. Have you heard about so-and-so? You need to be praying for him or her. It's true. We maybe should be praying for them, but we have to be careful who we share that information with. Maybe there is a proper circle of people that, that needs to know the issue but we don't have to broadcast it to the world. There might be people outside of a proper circle that, that maybe don't need to hear about that sin because maybe God's working in the heart of that individual and rather than cause more harm by sharing it with a lot of people, we should let love cover that sin and God can work in the heart of that person. We should be not, not quick to, to expose it, but rather continue to love. A lesson I might draw is that even in the midst of suffering and persecution, we can serve others by demonstrating love toward them. And Maybe we need to ask ourselves, do, do I hold grudges against people? Do I, I gossip about people when there's issues in their life? Do I fail to forgive? We need to respond as Christ would have us respond. And now as we think of this COVID-19 situation that we're still dealing with, as we think of the political divisions in our nation, we need to ask, am I showing love toward those who differ with me? With the COVID-19, we know there are some people that think it's a hoax. We have some people who take it extremely seriously. And, and, and there's all kinds of opinions in between. Even if we disagree with someone else, I exhort us to please show grace, show love toward each other. Because as I've said before, quite frankly, I'm not sure anyone knows the precise truth about all of this. And so we need to be gracious to one another. And I believe that's what Peter would say we should do. And even politically, we might strongly disagree with someone. But let's still demonstrate a proper Christ-like love toward them. Well, Peter's talked about being stable in prayer. He's talked about being steadfast in love, and now he moves to a third way that we can continue to serve others, and that is that we should be selfless in hospitality. Be selfless in hospitality. Look at verse 9, a very short, simple verse. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Uh, we should be selfless in our hospitality. One way we can demonstrate love is, is showing hospitality to people. Now, to really understand this verse, we have to think of the culture of Peter's day. Remember, these were believers who come out, came out of an unbelieving world. And for some of them, if they were a Jewish believer in Christ, they might have been disowned by their family. When they came to faith in Jesus Christ, the rest of their family might have basically, as we might say today, kicked them out of the family. They might have disowned them and stopped associating with them, even if they were a Gentile. Possibly their, their Gentile relatives began to, to hate them because of their faith in Jesus Christ and, and really kind of removed from any association with them. Those people needed others to show hospitality toward them. Also, as believers traveled around that ancient Roman Empire, 
They, they needed housing. They needed food when they went somewhere else. There weren't restaurants all over the place. There weren't many Holiday Inns and Best Western uh, motels around for people to stay in. And the people probably wouldn't have money to do it even if there were. We know there were certainly some inns, uh, places where people could stay in different places. But often those inns were very filthy. There was often immoral activity that took place there. And it was not a healthy place for a believer to be staying in. They needed people to open their homes and show hospitality. And also the early church did not have church buildings. We have this beautiful building we, we purchased. It's, a, it's not a new building, but it's new to us. A beautiful sanctuary. They didn't have those back in Peter's day. People met in, the, the church met in people's homes. Well, probably the more wealthy believers who had larger homes, often it fell to them to host the church. And so he's speaking to all those different types of situations and probably others when he says to show hospitality toward other people and we should do it properly. It's interesting, Paul uh, in the book of Romans also talks about having hospitality. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. And now listen to this last phrase, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Paul also speaks about showing proper hospitality. And then in, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, the writer of Hebrews says, Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. We're to show hospitality even to strangers if we have that opportunity. Now, he then concludes that verse by saying, we're to show hospitality without complaint. Without complaint. See, probably even in Peter's day, sometimes showing hospitality can become a burden. Maybe those believers extended their stay. Maybe the, the, the person with the larger house started to feel like they were being taken advantage of by always having to have things at their homes. We don't know what the situations might have been, but we know even for us, Sometimes a guest, it's good to stay for a while, but maybe they kind of mess the house up a little. Maybe the furniture gets messed around. Maybe, uh, you know, they kind of invade our privacy a little. There's all kinds of burdens that can happen as we show hospitality. And that's why Peter says, do it without complaint. Do it in a loving way that honors Jesus Christ. So I would say that we can serve other people by being selfless, in our hospitality. And hospitality is not just providing housing for someone or letting them into our home. It might be taking them out for a meal. It might be uh, in, in a worship service if visitors come or even people that we know, but especially visitors, being cordial, being welcoming to them and showing proper hospitality. It might mean meeting, meeting people's needs in different ways. I, I read the story or knew the story. Uh, this happened many, many years ago in Dallas. Uh, wonderful story of how hospitality can have a tremendous impact on someone's life. Now, this is an extreme example, but I'd like to share it. There was a seminary student who traveled about 30 miles on Sundays to attend church outside of Dallas, and uh, he used to pick up hitchhikers if they were hitchhiking on the way. This was back when picking up hitchhikers was probably a bit safer than it might be now. But one time he, he picked up a young man who looked fairly disheveled, and this, this student who was going to church had a, a suit, suit and tie on, and they got to talking, and the young man that he had picked up asked him, well, would you mind if I uh, went to church with you? And the student said, well, that'd be wonderful. I'd love to have you join me. And, and so he went to church with the student. After the service, the student took him back to his house. He fed him a warm meal. He let him take a shower. He got some good, clean clothes for him, and, and he found out that, that this young man that he picked up was a believer. He just had fallen away from the Lord for a while, but, but he it was on his way back to Akron, he, the, the student found out. And so the student bought him a bus ticket from Dallas all the way back to Akron, Ohio, so that he could get home. Well, as Paul Harvey would say, now for the rest of the story. About a week after he had, he had been with this student, this student got a letter from this young man. 
and there was a newspaper clipping. And the headlines of this particular article said, young man who committed murder turned himself in to authorities at the police station. And the article went on to explain how this young man, and this young man also explained in his letter to this student, that quite some time ago he had killed a young man. And he was running from the law. That's why he was down in Texas rather than Ohio. And he had fallen away from the Lord. And he was making his way back to Akron. But when this student picked him up and he went to church and this student showed such tremendous hospitality, the young man says, when I got back home, because of your love for me and your hospitality, I decided I need to get back straight with the Lord. And he went and turned himself in for murder because he wanted to make things right from a human perspective. He wanted to make things right with God. The hospitality of that young student made a tremendous difference in the lives of that man who had actually committed murder and brought him back to a relationship, a close relationship with the Lord. Now again, that's an extreme example. But if showing hospitality can bring that much of a change to the life of someone who's committed murder, how much more would it be for anyone who, who needs to have hospitality shown? Well, Peter has talked about being stable in prayer, being steadfast in love, being selfless in hospitality. And now in the last two verses that we're going to look at, verses 10 and 11, he talks about being good stewards of God's grace. Being good stewards of God's grace. Let's read, first of all, just verse 10, where we see Peter's exhortation. He says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. He says we should be stewards of of God's grace, and he, and he exhorts us, first of all, he tells us what we've received. He says in verse 10, the beginning, as each one has received a special gift. Now, when Peter talks about gift, I believe he's talking here about spiritual gifts. Now, we know that in Scripture, it makes it very clear in other passages that when we become a believer in Jesus Christ through faith, the Holy Spirit divinely gives each of us, every single believer, at least one and possibly more than one spiritual gift. Now, that's a term that's used for certain abilities that he gives us. They're not just natural talents like being an artist or a good athlete, but they're spiritual gifts that relate to the body of Christ. And Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapters 12 through 14, deals in length with spiritual gifts. And he talks about how all believers receive gifts. But there's something very important he says. He says, we don't pick which gifts we want the Holy Spirit sovereignly and divinely gives us whichever gifts God chooses that we should have. And he also says that those gifts are given to us not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of other believers and, and the rest of the world, and for, uh, the benefit of the body of Jesus Christ. All believers receive them. And again, in, in chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul gives a list of, of spiritual gifts. In Romans chapter 12, Paul gives a fairly lengthy list. But also in Ephesians, he mentions a few gifts. And I'd like to, to read just a portion of Ephesians 4, verse 7, and then verses 11 and 12. If you remember back in 1 Peter, uh, in, in verse 10, it said, uh, We've received a gift, employ it in being a good steward of the manifold grace of God. He talked about gifts being part of God's grace. Look, listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 4. It says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. He says, Here are some gifted people that God has given to the church for the building up of the body of Christ. And some of the examples of gifts there are is the gift of evangelism. Now, we're all called to evangelize, but some people have a special, unique ability to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. There, there's the gift of teaching. There's a gift of mercy. We're all to show mercy, but some people have a heightened ability to be able to, to see needs in someone or in a situation and move to meet those needs. There's the gift of giving. We're all to give. But some people have a heightened ability to give, and it doesn't 
mean it's just wealthy people who have this gift. Someone with very little human resources can also have the gift of giving. Uh, there's a gift of administration. There's a gift of exhortation. There are many, many gifts listed in, in 1 Corinthians 12 as well as Romans 12. But those are the lists. Then he, he says what we're to do with those gifts, though, back in 1 Peter chapter 10. He says, as each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another. A very important point about spiritual gifts is that they are not given to us primarily for our own benefit. Spiritual gifts are given to us to use to serve the body of Jesus Christ and to serve other people. They're designed to build up the body of Christ. Uh, if we have the gift of evangelism, we're to evangelize for the benefit of those that we're sharing the gospel with. We're not to evangelize with the motive of putting another notch in our belt saying, I led another person to Christ, look at me. That's not the purpose of the gift of evangelism. We're to do it selflessly out of love for the unbeliever and to lead them to Christ. If we have the gift of giving, we're to give and, and not make a big deal of it. We're to, to, again, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Uh, we're not to give for the purpose of maybe having our name given out on the local or on the, the Christian TV station telling how much we gave to that ministry. That's not the ultimate purpose. We're to do it out of love and, and for the glory of Christ. If we have the gift of mercy, we're to show mercy to people for the benefit of the people we're showing mercy to. We're not to show mercy to people so that we can take a selfie of ourselves doing the merciful deed so we can post it on Facebook and hope that a lot of people will praise us for the wonderful merciful deed that we just did. Now there's nothing wrong with people knowing that we've done something merciful or there's nothing necessarily wrong with people knowing that giving has been done in a certain way or that we've evangelized or used any other gift. But my point is that our, our primary desire should not be to draw attention to ourself. It is designed to minister to other people. That's the goal of spiritual gifts. They're there for the building up the body of Christ. Well, Peter also goes on and says why we're to use those gifts in that way. At the end of verse uh, uh, 10, he says we're to do them as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, we know that a steward is someone who is, is simply given charge of someone else's possession. In the Bible, in, in ancient times, a steward was accountable to his or her master. Their master might put them in charge of their money or their estate. There are parables that talk about that. The steward doesn't own, own anything. They are simply in charge of managing it for their master. And for us, our ultimate master is Jesus Christ. Therefore, when we are given spiritual gifts... Yes, we possess them, but ultimately they belong to God. And we are to use those gifts to bring glory to him because we're accountable to him. And I like how, how Peter says it, we're to, to employ them in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Manifold means the, the varied or the various kinds. It's a multitude of aspects of, of these, these spiritual gifts. Uh, we know there are many different gifts that we have, but, but even, even a particular gift can be manifested in different ways. I like to use the example that someone might have the gift of teaching. And we tend to think of a, a teacher as someone who can stand in front of a large group of people and expound the word of God, or, or an evangelist who, who is on television or has large crusades. And can, we, we might look at them as a great teacher, but someone can, can teach young children, and they might have the gift of teaching they might be scared to death to get in front of a group of, of adults, but they might be able to teach young children far better than someone who can preach to large crowds could. They have no less the gift of teaching than someone who can speak to large crowds. They have the gift as well. It's just manifested in a different manner. I had a professor at seminary that uh, I had him for one class. And to be quite frank, he was not the greatest teacher in the world. Uh, listening to him in class, sometimes we just struggled listening to him. But I loved to read his books. His books were clear, they were concise, they were well written, and I learned a lot from that man 
reading his books. Now, I learned some things in class as well, but he was far better teaching through his writing. That's another way that the gift of teaching can be manifested. This multifaceted view, different evangelism. Some people are better at evangelizing adults. Some people are, are better at evangelizing people of different faiths. Some people are, again, better at evangelizing children. The same gift can be manifested in different ways. And that's true with, with probably almost all of the gifts. So we need to keep that in mind. I like to use the analogy of a prism. If you know what a prism is, it's a, a glass thing. It, it's clear. It looks clear. But when a light shines through it or the sun shines through it, it, it goes into the prism. And when it comes out the other side, what happens? It gives you this array of colors, the rainbow colors all spread out. You can shine it on a wall. And I like to look at the body of Christ as being like that prism. We're all one. We're united. And I'm talking about the body of Christ worldwide now. We have that, that body of Christ the Son, Jesus Christ, shines His light through that body of Christ, and out of that comes this beautiful array of all of these different gifts given to benefit the entire body of Christ and indirectly even the unbelieving world in many ways. I like that picture of, of Jesus Christ shining through us, and then we each have our own individual color that adds to the beauty of the, of the church of, of Jesus Christ and of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Well, now in verse 11, as we conclude with this verse, Peter gives some examples of spiritual gifts. And, and unlike Paul, Paul lists several different gifts in 1 Corinthians and in Romans. Peter really mentions two general categories of gifts. Let's read verse 11. He says, Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength of which God supplies. We'll stop there for a second. He talks about two general categories. He doesn't give a lengthy list, but he mentions one general category, what we might call speaking gifts. He says, whoever speaks, let him do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Some spiritual gifts involve speaking. We think of, of the gift of evangelism. You generally are speaking, sharing the word. I talked about my professor who was a good writer, but often when we think of the gift of teaching, we think of someone who is speaking. Someone who has the gift of exhortation is really good at exhorting us and encouraging us in different ways. They're generally speaking to people. Uh, there are, are, are other gifts, certainly the early apostles who were gifted people. The early New Testament prophets were gifted people who, who did speaking. So they were part of those who had these speaking gifts. And it was crucial, though, that it, as Peter says, that those who speak do so as speaking the utterances of God. Those of us who have any of those speaking gifts need to be sure that what we're doing is faithfully sharing the word of God, not simply our own opinions, not simply things we wish would be true or that, that the culture around us would like to believe were to utter the things that are God's truth himself. Then secondly, he talks about what we might call service gifts. He goes on and says, whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. Now, all gifts were to serve other people, but there's the speaking gifts and the serving gifts are sometimes maybe we might call them more the behind the scenes gifts. Uh, they might be things like, like the gift of, of, of giving. Where, where we might be giving behind the scenes. It might be the gift of mercy, where we're serving other people, and, and it's more behind the scenes. We might have, there is a gift of hospitality. Uh, we might have that special gift, where we can do that well. There's a gift of helps. There's a gift of administration, a gift of leadership. Some of those gifts aren't as maybe up front as the speaking gifts, but yet they're, they're equally important because all these gifts are all important. They all work together for the body of Christ to function properly. And no gifts should look down on another gift. We are all, they are all necessary. Uh, point I'd make is that, that all spiritual gifts need to be done through God's divine enablement. Through his divine enablement. We can't accomplish them on our own. Jesus in chapter 15 of the book of John, verse 5 talked about how we need to abide in him. And he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. I think what he means by that is apart from Jesus Christ in us, we cannot accomplish anything of eternal value. But as we abide in him, 
He empowers us to accomplish those things He wants us to accomplish. With spiritual gifts, it's the same way. He empowers us to use our gifts as He desires. And then we see what the ultimate result of this should be at the end of verse 11. He says, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The result of being good stewards of God's grace, being good stewards of the spiritual gifts God has given us, is that God would be glorified in all things, Peter says. And through our prayers, through our loving one another, through our hospitality, through our serving, even through our suffering, we should desire that Jesus Christ should be glorified. And it says to Jesus Christ belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Final lesson I draw is that as stewards of God's grace, we should use our spiritual gifts to serve others and to bring glory to Jesus Christ. I mentioned that in chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul dealt with spiritual gifts. And in those chapters, he's actually, in large part, reprimanding the Corinthian church for using their gifts improperly, or, or certain gifts at least. They were doing it to bring glory to themselves. And Paul says, no, the purpose of your gifts is not to bring glory to yourselves. It is to serve other people. And he was really reprimanding them. And that's why between chapters 12, where he lists the gifts and talks about how they're given, and chapter 14, where he gives lots of corrections, he inserts chapter 13 that I read from earlier, that, that love chapter that we often read at weddings. But the context of it really is in the context of using our spiritual gifts. Peter tell, or Paul tells us in those chapters, as we use our gifts, whatever it is, do it with a proper love. Don't do it for our own glory. Do it for the love of the brethren and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Well, today we have looked at uh, Peter exhorting us in our grace for suffering uh, to uh, how to respond. We saw last week the reality of our suffering, that we are going to suffer, we're going to have persecution. But even today, now in the midst, he says, here's how you should respond. And in today we've seen that he says we should continue to serve other people. And we can serve them by being stable in prayer. We can serve other people by, by being steadfast in our love for them. We can serve them by being selfless in showing hospitality. As we've just seen, we can serve others by being stewards of God's grace. Well, next week, we're going to be continuing. We'll be looking at verses 12 through 19 of chapter 4. Again, I would encourage you to read those verses, maybe several times before next week, and we'll come back and we'll look at that set of verses next week as we continue in this section. I would encourage you to read that. But once again, as I always do, I conclude by saying that in the book of 1 Peter, he is encouraging the people he wrote to. He's encouraging us to always, even in the face of persecution and suffering and difficulties, to stand firm in God's grace and to live graceful lives even in a graceless world. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, once again, we turn to you. We thank you that it is you who have sovereignly given us gifts. You have sovereignly given us the ability to show hospitality, to love, to serve one another. Help us, Father, to use those abilities and those gifts to your glory. Help us to look at the fact that no matter what we're going through in life, you still desire for us as much as possible to continue to serve other people. Lord, how we do that might change as we go through difficult times, but yet you call us to still be consistent in that, to, to be stable in our prayer and steadfast in our love and, and uh, selfless in our hospitality and be good stewards of God's grace with the gifts that, that he has given us. Lord, I pray that this week we might uh, look for those ways that we can continue to serve others in a way that brings honor and glory to the person of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.